Uh, dear colleagues, uh, let me thank the faculty for a kind invitation to participate in this session. Still, uh, it was quite a complex uh, issue for me to speak uh, on this topic because I grew up as a specialist in the time of targeted therapy. And since 2006, we started to thoroughly search patients with non squamous uh, lung cancer uh, for uh, activating mutations and treat treating these patients with uh, TKI in particular. And uh, chemotherapy for such patients uh, during all this period was some kind of a uh, compromise with the limited uh, efficacy and moderate impact on overall survival of patients. Uh, today I will talk about uh, uh, our view on individualization of treatment uh, of non-small cell lung cancer with and without activating mutations. I will try to summarize the contemporary data and share with you uh, some of our results that we received during all these years. As far as I'm going to, t to talk about patients without activating mutations, uh, I have the privilege to start right from the beginning. And uh, the beginning of chemotherapy for non-small cell lung cancer can be dated to early 80s, when the introduction of, t uh, of uh, platinum agents and cisplatin in particular led to the improve improvement of overall survival of patients with non-small cell lung cancer. But as I may assume, as far as I was uh, a child at that time, uh, the individualization of treatment at that time was based primarily on the contraindications for, uh, for cisplatin and uh, still uh, the patients were treated or not treated with uh, chemotherapy based on platinum agents. The 90s grew, uh, gave rise uh, to the new agents uh, that were quite effective in non-small cell lung cancer and it was the result of the large NIH program started in the middle of 50s and it was aimed to screen the chemical compounds for anti-tumor activity. And this led to the appearance and clinical development of the newer third-generation drugs, paclitaxel, uh, gemcitabine, and uh, venorelbin, which appeared to be effective in combination with uh, the platinum compounds. By the end of the 90s, it became absolutely apparent that this uh, that these regimens are, uh, have quite similar efficacy and toxicity profile. And head-to-head uh, -head comparison of uh, the regimens was, uh, uh, was urgently needed at that time. And it was done. It was uh, the trial ECOG 1592, uh, 98, uh, 94, <laughs> sorry, uh, which uh, was the head-to-head -head comparison of four most widely used uh, platinum-based regimens in non-small cell lung cancer. And the trial was negative because it showed, uh, it did not show any benefit for any particular, uh, uh, particular regimen if we take the general population of non-small cell lung cancer patients. But still, when I came to residency, this trial was a base for me uh, to individualize care for patients based on some financial issues because we do not always have all the drugs and uh, we should choose uh, the, the drugs that we do have and based on the toxicity profile. Uh, during all the 90s, uh, as I understood from the literature, uh, there was uh, a way to individualize therapy based on the age and the performance status of patients. The elderly patients and the patients with poor performance status would tend not to be treated aggressively. But the, uh, this was the uh, vice versa direction of the development because in this field uh, the chemotherapy goes from individualization to de-individualization because in the first decade of this century it was shown that uh, elderly patients uh, can be treated with platinum based regimens uh, especially uh, particularly feed patients and this can bring to the improvement in overall and progression free survival as far as uh, response rate and the same situation was with uh, poor performance status of course this uh, is limited to the category of patients whose performance status is determined by the tumor-related symptoms. These patients also can be treated aggressively with the uh, platinum-based regimens, and this, can, uh, this, uh, this treatment can improve progression-free overall survival and overall response rate. Uh, still, the 90s were marked with the burst in the improvement of molecular genetic technologies. And there were a lot of markers that were screened in, in various solid tumors. And in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, this was ERCC1, RM1, uh, BRCA1, and many others. We conducted uh, a retrospective analysis in which we analyzed patients with non-small cell lung cancer with uh, two major histologies, squamous cell and adenocarcinoma, for, uh, and um, determined, uh, is there any 
correlation between the expression of uh, ERCC1 uh, and the efficacy uh, of platinum-based regimens in terms of progression-free survival. And we found no correlation, unfortunately. And this was, in a few years, uh, approved with, in the large phase three trial, uh, which randomized patients based on uh, the expression of two markers, RM1 and ERCC1, that were determined by RT-PCR and IHC. And this trial was also negative, though uh, the, uh, the biggest survival advantage was achieved in patients in the control arm who received carboplatin and uh, venorolabine. Uh, and the same uh, uh, trials, small phase two trials, they continue until now. Uh, uh, this is uh, the trial published in 2012 of two markers, RM1 uh, and uh, BSC1. While sitting in the, in the previous uh, sections, I looked the literature through and found uh, the trial that was finished and published in 2016, uh, which randomized patients based on uh, error expression of RM1 and uh, RCC1, and it was also negative. Uh, there are some newer markers, for example, uh, timidolat synthase. It appeared that uh, in timidolat synthase negative patients, uh, uh, chemotherapy with pemetric set, especially in the second line uh, and in the first line, also can be more effective than uh, gigemcitabine plus, uh, plus cis uh, cisplatin. But look at the difference. It's less than a month. Is it clinically significant? And that is the question. And at this point, we come to the idea that uh, probably we cannot determine the efficacy and determine the best population for the treatment with chemotherapy based on one marker. Uh, and during all this time, this approach uh, of uh, searching for and validation of uh, uh, different genetic markers were, was criticized. And uh, the idea for criticism, for criticism lies in two fields. The first one is that uh, probably the expression marker is not the best one that we have, because it's not black and white. Expression can be low, moderate, high, or even ultra high, as we know, for the expression of EGFR uh, and the efficacy of cetoximab. Uh, but it is, uh, this makes it very difficult to compare between the uh, examinations and between the trials. And the second idea is that the markers that we are looking for uh, do have uh, other roles in the cell. For example, ERCC1 uh, not only participate in the excision repair pathway, but also is closely related to P53 signaling cascade. And for this reason, uh, the biology of the tumor is much more complex than we could estimate with only one marker. Uh, and this is uh, approved in, uh, in a very interesting observation. This is the results of uh, this study of presotinib in uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients, uh, alt positive non-small cell lung cancer patients. And uh, uh, the efficacy of pemetric set for this population was extremely high. And there are two explanations for this. The first one is that uh, there is particular sum correspondence between the biology of ILK-positive tumors and the efficacy of pemetric set. And the second one is that the population of ILK-positive patients is highly enriched with patients with limited or no smoking history. And probably, this, definitely, these patients do have the other biology from smokers. And probably pemetric set is more efficacious in patients with, uh, who did not have smoking, uh, smoking history. But can we use these biomarkers in our everyday clinical uh, clinical work? And my answer is probably no, because, uh, and here is one example. The patient with LK positive tumor received crizotinib and had a partial response of his uh, lung and liver uh, uh, lesions, and uh, he had the progression of the disease at six months. And at this point, we started to treat him with uh, the most effective for this type of tumors, a regimen cisplatin and pemetric set. After two cycles, he developed a rapid progression with the increasing size of the, two of the liver lesions and the appearance of new multiple bone metastasis. This patient died soon afterwards. And this brings us to the idea that the biology of tumor is far more complex than we, uh, than we can understand with only one marker. In order to investigate this question, a very interesting uh, uh, work was launched in the United States. It was the Cancer Genome Atlas Research Network Project. It um, gathered uh, uh, tumor samples from various tumor types, uh, and in particular in lung cancer, it was non-small cell lung cancer, uh, it was non-squamous cell lung cancer, and squamous cell lung cancer. And uh, these tumors undergone the most innovative and high throughput methods of molecular research. In particular, whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, uh, whole, exome, uh, whole genome expression analysis, uh, mRNA analysis, and, and many others. But interestingly, the conclusions that, uh, that we received for 
different tumor types were approximately the same. Uh, and, they were the, uh, and, uh, and they were the following, that uh, despite the absolute individuality of every tumor, we, cannot, we can hardly find the, uh, the same tumors uh, from different patients. Uh, they can be gathered together in the subtypes based on the profile of molecular alterations that lie in the beginning of the tumor. That uh, define the pathogenesis of this tumor. And, uh, for example, lung adenocarcinoma were divided into three subtypes. Uh, it is uh, pro proximal proliferative, proximal inflammatory, terminal respiratory unit. And uh, these subtypes have different biology. For example, terminal respiratory unit was enriched with uh, molecular uh, activating uh, alterations. And uh, for this reason, the most patients who did not have a smoking history, they uh, got uh, the terminal respiratory unit subtype. And this subtype uh, do have the prognosis significant, especially uh, the true subtype, which uh, patients with true subtype has a much better survival than, uh, than other patients. But unfortunately, even such complex analysis uh, of, uh, with the, the use of most innovative and high throughput methods cannot give us the answer or any predictive answer for the, edu for the use of adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Uh, the other situation, uh, angiogenesis. This theory was proposed in, uh, by Judah Folkman and published in 1971 in New England Journal of Cancer. Afterwards, there was a burst of research in this field, and several agents were uh, uh, included in the standards of care, such as bevacizumab or, for example, ramasurumab. But unfortunately, during all this time, for more than 10 years, there are no clinical predictive markers for the therapy with angiogenic therapy. But there are some clinical groups that derive the most benefit. For example, for the newer anti-angiogenic drug, Nintendanib, uh, this group is a group of patients who progress between, uh, before nine months uh, until nine months uh, from the uh, completion of first-line chemotherapy. But we unfortunately cannot define this group based on our uh, predictive markers, mo molecular markers that we do have. The other type of treatment newly emerged type of treatment is the immunotherapy and immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors. Now two drugs are uh, approved for the second line treatment is pembrolizumab and nivolumab. And as far as this type of treatment was started in the era of targeted therapy, the research in this field went along with the, uh, with the, uh, with the biomarker discovery. And there is such a biomarker. It is the expression of PDL1. It appeared that patients that do have high expression of this biomarker derive the most benefit from this type of treatment. But still, clinicians don't like this biomarker because there are some patients that uh, benefited much from the treatment with anti pdl one agents uh, and do not have the expression of, uh, uh, of PDL1. And another issue uh, against this biomarker is that it uh, is dynamic. It can change in one tumor with time, and it can also uh, be different in the different regions of the tumor, or in, in the different sites of the tumor. Uh, and, but still, there are some groups that derive benefit and some groups that do not. And here I want to show you a small retrospective analysis that was presented this year at ASCO. It, is, uh, it deals with tumor growth rate. Tumor growth rate is the difference in the size of the tumor lesions between baseline and first consecutive examination. If the patient have the regression of, of the tumor, their uh, tumor growth rate is below zero. If he do not have the change in size or the increase in tumor size, it is uh, equal to zero or above it. And look at the results. None of the 15 patients with that uh, tumor growth rate below zero uh, would, uh, died during the first year, while 31 out of 43 patients with uh, tumor growth rate equal or above zero died during the first year. So there are some groups, there are some uh, patients that derive the most, most benefit, but we cannot now uh, define uh, who are they. And here we come to very important questions. What do we need these biomarkers for? When we speak about uh, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, and the expensive drug. It is obvious that we need them, uh, we need biomarkers uh, in order to limit the size of the population that receive, uh, receives this expensive, uh, expensive treatment for the patients who derive the most benefit. But 
What about chemotherapy? What do we need the biomarkers for? Because the majority of patients receive chemotherapy in the beginning or in the end of the clinical course of their disease. And here I want to share with you a very interesting idea that I saw in the publication by uh, Roy Herbst in uh, Lancet of Oncology last year. It's about this second line therapy with pembrolizumab uh, in comparison to docetaxel. And what does it say, say uh, says us? It tells that in this phase three trial, there was an extremely high dropout rate of patients. And the majority of patients withdrew their informed consent when they were allocated to docetaxel arm, which means that patients believe in this type of treatment and they want to receive PDL1 inhibitors because they believe that they can uh, acquire much benefit from this treatment. Do you think that it's attributed to the 10% increase in one year uh, overall survival? Or maybe it is attributed to three months increase in medium overall survival or 10% increase in overall response rate? I think that it is not. Of course, it is attributed uh, to the median duration of response. Look, for the first line patients, it's about 24 months. It's, tell, it's two years, but it's the medium. 50% uh, uh, of patients lived without progression of the disease longer than two years. And uh, it is the biomarkers that patients are looking for because they want it to be cured from cancer. Uh, and this slide I draw from the uh, lecture that was made by Professor Salz at ASCO uh, 2012. Uh, it is about metastatic colorectal cancer and the analysis of the large uh, phase three trial of three chemotherapeutic regimens. Uh, 1,500 patients were included. Seven, uh, 62 of 1,500 patients uh, achieved complete response during first-line chemotherapy. 10 out of uh, 52 of 60, uh, out of uh, 62 uh, had progression of the disease during observation, but 10 out of 62, which is 16 percent, and 0.66 percent from the whole population, they lived for more than five years without disease progression. And uh, we can say, we can state that these patients were cured from cancer with the first-line chemotherapy. And every specialist who is treating solid tumors and non-small cell lung cancer in particular do have such examples. Here is ours. Uh, in 2005, patient was diagnosed with uh, large cells uh, middle lobe lung cancer with mediastinal lymph nodes, metastasis, and liver metastasis. Patients received the first line chemotherapy in clinical trial with uh, gemcis and uh, bevacizumab. After six cycles, he achieved complete response in the of the thoracic lesions and partial response of his liver lesions. And until 2016, for 11 years, patient was alive without signs of disease progression. And in uh, this year, uh, last month, uh, uh, in May, we discovered another lesion, and we are now waiting for the IHC of these patients in order to start uh, treating him. And for this reason, I think that the most important uh, aim of our treatment is uh, the cure of the patients. And from this point, I think that a very interesting uh, initiative was launched in uh, 2014 by NIH. It is exceptional responders to cancer therapy study. This includes uh, patients that uh, have, uh, that fit the recommendations of this trial and the biomaterial from these patients, not only tumor material, but also normal material and uh, biofluids was, uh, it, uh, was uh, 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 gathered together and undergone the most advanced and the most innovative uh, whole genome uh, analysis. Uh, because we now understand that there is not, no, not only tumor markers, we should uh, search also the host organism, and we should search the interactions between the host organisms and uh, the tumor cells. This, uh, this trial was open to, in 2014, and um, in 2015, where, uh, where I, I, I found the only interim analysis, there are already 72 pa uh, patients included in this trial, and there are very interesting results. The majority of these patients received the standard of care treatment, and the majority of them were alive at, one, uh, 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 at, at 2015. But still, we do have a very effective predictive markers. Predictive markers for the small proportion of patients with activation mutations. Uh, this picture was taken from uh, William Power uh, article in The Lancet in two, uh, 2009. And we, must, we may say that our 
understanding of the molecular pathology of non, of non small cell lung cancer and adenocarcinoma in particular did not change greatly since that time. There were a few mutations that were uh, discovered during this period, but still, we now can effectively target uh, the majority of these mutations, and there will be new drugs that will be more efficacious in this field. Uh, but the first one, historically the first one, was EGFR mutations. And here I want to draw your attention to the fact that the discovery of EGFR mutations was an absolutely based on clinical observations. Clinical observations of the higher and profound efficacy of these drugs in, the, in some patients uh, of general population. And because of these profound uh, uh, dramatic responses, the patients were uh, analyzed and the EGFR gene was analyzed and the activation mutations were discovered. We performed a retrospective analysis of adenocarcinoma that we treated in uh, Institute of Oncology uh, Center. 150 patients were searched for EGFR mutations and we showed that uh, our frequency, uh, the frequency for Northwest region of Russia, 19.8%, uh, makes us uh, more uh, resemble the European population uh, and we are quite uh, different from the Asian population. Afterwards, we performed a small phase two trial. Uh, it was a prospective uh, phase two trial of first-line gefitinib in patients with activating mutations. And we showed quite an obvious uh, fact with uh, nine months of progression-free survival uh, and about 14 months of overall survival. But last year, we decided to perform the second analysis. And when we analyzed the patients that received the same treatment, but several years uh, afterwards, during the last three years, and we show, and was, was very surprised to see that uh, the patients in the last cohort, they lived much longer. And the time to, uh, to, uh, to uh, drug withdrawal was much higher in them. And we analyzed the results, and we uh, understood that it was uh, related not to the newer drugs that appeared during this time, not to the, by the newer markets, but it was because we stratified and um, our clinical techniques used in the patients with activation mutations. Now we know that we can continue first uh, generation TKI beyond progression, and this could increase in some patients uh, time to deliver of chemotherapy. We can provide local uh, uh, local therapy, especially, for example, with patients with uh, lung metastasis, as Professor Capuzzo told us. Uh, we can switch to the next generation drugs, uh, th uh, second generation or third generation, and we can deliver pa patients chemotherapy and afterwards try to treat them with first generation TKI. Uh, but there are, of course, new markers and new, uh, new uh, treatment options. And uh, the last one that I found at uh, ESCO this year was uh, the combination of BRAF and MEK inhibitor in BRAF uh, mutated non small cell lung cancer. But do we know a lot and do we know all about the patients with activation mutations? For a long time, it was thought that these tumors are stupid. They do have only one mutation, and block, by blocking this pathway, we will receive uh, the best response and we will cure these patients. But unfortunately, the things uh, are not that simple, and it is obvious nowadays. nowadays. And here is one example. We, uh, in December, the patient of ours was diagnosed with, lung, with metastatic lung adenocarcinoma. His material was sent to uh, Profe Professor Minito's laboratory, and we determined uh, the deletion in, uh, nine, in zone 19. Afterwards, the patient was included in the screening for FLORA trial, and uh, we were very surprised uh, to receive uh, that he do have the uh, wild type uh, EGFR according to COBAS analysis. We re-performed this analysis and determined the particular type of deletions that was present in this patient and started treating him with second generation uh, TKI afatinib. But look at the results. After two months, patients did have some uh, clinical improvement, but still the objective response was measured as stabilization uh, with the tendency to increase in survival. Does this patient have mutation? or uh, he have a polyclonal tumor uh, with some cells responding to therapy and some not. We do not know this, but still we decided to continue this drug for two months more and after that uh, uh, examine these patients once more. We do have a very effective options for treating patients who develop the resistance, uh, the resistance of, uh, uh, to, uh, to first generation targeted agents. It is also, uh, uh, especially in patients with T1790M mutations, and third generation is extremely uh, effective in this field. But do we know all about T1790M? 
uh, and unfortunately, no. Now we can screen the patients and we can follow the patient's uh, uh, resistance with the biofluid analysis of uh, T790M, which, before, which is performed uh, in, uh, in the Russia, for example, is uh, Dina Damirovna lab. And we also, uh, uh, the frequency of uh, T790M in the primary material depends on the method that we use to determine it. It might be from 4 to 63%. And which of these patients we should treat with third generation drugs, we do not know now. And with this, let me come to the conclusions that we do have very good prognostic markers for the small proportion of patients with activating mutations and we can effectively treat them. But the situation appears to be much more complex than it is now. Uh, there are no validated biomarkers for chemotherapy, unfortunately. But still, cure from metastatic cancer can be achieved and the predictive markers for, for cure uh, are, is unmet need and uh, urgently need, needed by our patient. But the most important, the last one, but I think the most important that I want to share with you uh, is the fact that, and here I want to remind you that the major advances in the targeted treatment of non-small cell lung cancer were, clinical, were based on clinical observations. And for this reason, all of us who is treating non-small cell lung cancer patients with either chemotherapy or targeted therapy or immunotherapy, we do have in our hands the most powerful weapon against, uh, in, the war of, uh, in the war against cancer. It is the observation of our patients. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Fyodor, for your brilliant speech. I believe it's very interesting and I guess we do not have any time to ask you any questions. Thank you very much for participating in this session.